Oh, yeah, All they right, got cool. one. Good to know. Ooh, 36%. You have your... I do have it. Gentlemen, let's go. Have a seat. Hurry up. Latino, I yell, oh yeah.
I'm a sophomore here at Gilman, of course, and um, my grandfather, I'm here to speak about the story of my grandfather who was um, born in Cuba, 1943. His name was Eduardo Gonzalez. So um, if you know anything about Cuban history, 1960 was when uh, the Cuban Revolution was in like high gear. And uh, at this time, my grandfather was 17, so he was eligible to get a scholarship to go study in Hungary. Um, and the scholarship was presented to him by the uh, um, Castro administration. Um, and so if he took the scholarship, he would have returned to Cuba and worked for Fidel Castro. Um, so of course his mom didn't want that because he, she didn't want um, him to put their family in danger and risk being imprisoned. So she sent him to Tampa Bay. Um, and in Tampa is where his brother Oscar was living at the time. And if it wasn't for his brother Oscar, he would be working for Fidel Castro. Um, his brother was living in the United States, so he was able to um, move. Um, so in Tampa, they owned a hospital called the Gonzalez Clinic. Um, that was where uh, many famous people from Tampa were born. Um, basically, all Cuban people were born in that clinic um, that lived in Tampa. Um, so, a little more on why he was sympathetic with the revolution. Um, he believed in their stance against American imperialism um, and their call for social justice. Now, he was uh, naive at the time, and um, now he's 73 years old, 74. Um, and now that he looks back on it, he thought, well, he was stupid, and um, you know, he really regrets being sympathetic with the revolution, but he was glad that his brother lived in the United States. Um, and he was granted a student visa when, when he came over, so he, was, um, so he was allowed to stay. So today, he's a professor at Johns Hopkins University, and every January, um, he travels back to Cuba um, with students. Now, he couldn't do it this year because, well, the legal drinking age in Cuba is 16. Um, and uh, some of the students got in trouble for that last year. Um, <laughs> So he still does it every year, and um, I've been to Cuba five times, four, four times, sorry, um, with my grandfather, my dad, my brother only went once. He went once when he was three. Um, so I do look forward to going back to Cuba pretty soon, and that's the story of my grandfather. Hi, I'm Jacob Delgado, I'm a 10th grader, and this is a story about how my family was able to uh, leave Cuba and come to the U.S. So, um, my family began in the city of Pinar del Rio, which is a city in the far west of Cuba, and it was mainly an agricultural community, however, they were involved in the community. And in 1961, when um, basically their side of the country finally was able to fall to communism, because after Havana was taken, there was a period of anarchy in that area, Pretty much my great-grandfather was detained in a movie theater, which had became a prison, and all of their properties were um, taken and possessed by the state. So he ended up sending my grandmother and great-uncle to go to the U.S. under Operation Peter Pan, which, sorry, which was an operation basically to take unregistered Cuban minors to the U.S. so that they wouldn't be prosecuted under the Castro regime. So basically they were able to be sent to the U.S. for pretty much just the cost of an airplane ticket and being able to live their life in the U.S. to save themselves from communism. And um, basically, at that point, with just my grandmother and great uncle living in um, Miami alone, they were able to help try to build a community of um, fellow Cubans in the area, and they were really able to help try to bring together the community after a traumatizing event. And later on, my great-grandfather was able to get over to Miami, however, the it was difficult because obviously he had to leave a prison and get onto um, an airplane without being detected by a, a pretty much an authoritarian regime. So that is difficult. And um, to this day, until my grandmother's death last year, she was very much against the Castro regime due to the fact that they would repossess, repossess their house. And most personally significant probably was a moment when um, she was able to see pictures of their old house convert into a hospital and seeing like their house kind of collapsing on itself really brought back memories to her about that. So. That's kind of the personal significance, at least to me, about, La about Hispanic Heritage Month. Thanks. Good morning. Uh, 
I would like all of you to try to think about a famous person that you know of that is from a Spanish-speaking country. Just think about what you know that they look like, if it fits in a particular mold that you think of when you think of a Spanish-speaking person. Okay, Sofia Vergara, right? So we're going to take a look at a video and um, learn about different celebrities who are Latinos, okay? And take a, see if we can kind of change our perception of what it is to what Latino might look like. Sure, I got be like, be like, ooh, they look Latino. I yell, oh yeah, if they look, they Latino. We all know Latinos don't come in just one way, shape, or form, or do we? Throughout the year, society and media have created this stereotypical way of how Latinos should look, and if you don't look Latino enough, what does that even mean? Then you're just simply not, I guess. So today, I'm gonna try to break that stereotype by going around the office and showing pictures of some celebrities and having my coworkers guess if the celeb is Latino or not. Follow me. Uh, no, she looks white. That's Amanda Bynes. <laughs> Your celebrity knowledge is great, first of all. No, I will say no. That's not Amanda Bynes. I will say no. No? Uh, no. No. She's actually fully Latina. Her dad is from Argentina, and her mom is from Mexico. Wow. She grew up learning Spanish. Really? Yeah. I had no idea. Latino. I know he's Hispanic. I think I read it somewhere. He seems like he's half Latino. Um. His name is Tyler Posey, and he is Mexican from his mom's side. I could sense a brotherhood. I know he's Jewish because he makes a lot of jokes about that. I don't think he is Latino. He's, uh, wasn't he born in Mexico or something like that? No, I don't think he's Latino. He actually is part Latino. He's Mexican from his dad side. What? He even lived in Mexico till he was like six. Yes, Tatiana Ali is Latina for sure. I mean, in my mind growing up, I never knew or considered her to be Latina. I thought that she just identified as black. I think her father's Trinidadian and her mother is from Panama. Is she Dominican? She's Panamanian from her mom's side. Still never would have guessed that. It's always surprising to find out like someone who doesn't look like it's stereotypically on TV or something. It's cool to see Latinos representing and being very successful in the entertainment industry. If you look at Louis C.K. and Tatiana Ali, they both are of Latina and Latino descent, but look so different. Also, it's important to recognize that we all come from different backgrounds, and that's what the beauty of America is. Well, now you know, guys, there is no one way, shape, or form Latinos should or shouldn't look. Don't judge a book by its cover. Hopefully, I prove a point. Ivan Emilio, out. Mic drop. Okay, guys, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the Spanish use of the Spanish language in the United States. And it's, it's important to point out that not all Latinos or, or Hispanics in the United States speak Spanish, right? It just means that your heritage is from a Spanish-speaking country. That said, the number of people who do speak Spanish, the number of Latinos who speak Spanish in the United States is quite astounding. Um, so we're going to look at some statistics. And I'm actually going to ask you to take out your phone here. Um, and please go. Some of you have already done this with me in class. Please go to this uh, address, pollev.com slash MatthewZila683. Uh-oh. OK. OK. And I'm going to activate this. OK, and we're just going to kind of test our knowledge here. Um, there's five questions still here. I'll give you about 20 seconds to respond. How many people do you think speak Spanish in the United States? Is it 2 million, 12 million, 52 million, 102 million? Oh, 102 million is making a. All right, we'll say five, four, three. Okay, 
Looks like we're somewhere between 52 million and 102 million. Uh, I think the population of the United States is over 300 million. And the correct answer is, whoops, wrong thing. Okay, 52 million Spanish speakers in the United States. Good job, guys. Okay, 41 monolingual native speakers and 11 million bilinguals. Okay, all right, let's try another one. All right, let's talk about Maryland, okay? How many people speak Spanish in Maryland? Number of Spanish speakers in Maryland. Okay. The poll is full. Okay. 350,000. Let's take a look. Okay. I think we're looking pretty good. Oh, yeah. Two for two. Okay. 351,000, about 5.8% of our total population. Okay. We think about California, that's more like 32%, but, um, but not bad. 5.8. Okay, a couple more. All right, what about this one? The most common ancestry of Hispanics in Maryland. Okay, are they Salvadorian, Mexican, Puerto Rican, Spanish? Spanish meaning, of course, from Spain. Go five, four, three, two, one. Okay, I'm going with Salvadorian, and that response is again correct. Okay, it's a little hard to see, but you can see that about a quarter of uh, Hispanics in Maryland are from uh, Salvadorian descent, followed by Mexican and then Puerto Rican. Two more. I thought this one was interesting. Uh, how many people speak Spanish in their home in Baltimore? What would you say in Baltimore City? Looks like we're going with 21,000. And I, I like this stat because more people speak Spanish in Baltimore than there are people in my hometown of Cumberland, Maryland. Um, so that's, that's a pretty significant number. Okay, and then this is the last one. Um, and this one is an open response, so just kind of type in what you think. The top five Spanish-speaking countries in the world, okay? Top five Spanish-speaking countries in the world. What do you think? Other ideas for the top five? Besides Spain and Mexico? Argentina, right? Okay, we'll stop there. So, um, you guys are, are correct that, okay, Mexico is, is definitely number one. Um, And I found it interesting, you guys kind of uh, laughed a little bit when someone wrote USA, 
but look at this. Guys, we're number two now. We are number two in the world. Okay. Fairly recently overtook Spain, um, you know, where the, where the language originated. So just something to think about. The United States is a, not only a, a, a country of, of many cultures, but also, uh, you know, increasingly a bilingual, a bilingual country. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm glad that you chose that one in the end. I think yeah, that was I think the best that was one. the right one. Yeah. yeah. That's good. 